lastly, Dr. Cosgrove, obviously it's the topic that's pertinent to every single discussion around uh, advancing healthcare right now and responding to current needs. Um, there is a role of um, understanding pulmonary fibrosis as it pertains to uh, COVID-19 risk and detection and understanding uh, the disease progression and severity risk uh, among certain patient populations. Uh, I've asked a lot of people in different specialties across different fields because of the multidimensional effect of, of the virus, how it affects them, how exactly uh, does it play a role into pulmonary fibrosis? Yeah, I, I guess uh, it's a really great question and we get regularly. We, we don't understand if there's a, an intrinsic risk for acquiring the virus um, or if it accelerates um, or uh, they have a worse outcome because those data just aren't um, available as of yet. What we're concerned about is that anyone with chronic lung disease, whether it be asthma, COPD, or pulmonary fibrosis, they're in a higher risk category. And what that means is because of their compromised lung function, their ability to tolerate a serious lung infection with, with the virus and develop COVID-19 um, is more likely. And, and we're concerned that their ability to recover from an overwhelming infection would be less. But that doesn't mean that, that necessarily if they already get infected, they would progress to the severe disease that we've seen throughout the country. But obviously, we want to be as cautious as possible since they're at risk for serious infection. Um, the other issue that's been throughout the, the media is the association with lung fibrosis as a consequence of severe COVID-19, especially in those individuals that have had severe respiratory failure and been on the ventilator or um, or for two or three or unfortunately four weeks. So in those with se severe lung injury, um, we know that there's a risk for developing pulmonary fibrosis. Um, and that has been known for quite some while with a term called acute resp respiratory distress syndrome. In those that have had that overwhelming lung injury from um, a common pneumonia like pneumococcal pneumonia or influenza or now COVID-19, uh, we know that that can damage the lung. Um, in those individuals we, we, we've seen in the past, that tends not to be a progressive disease after individuals recover from that serious lung injury. Um, we believe the same thing may be happening in COVID-19, but as you allude to, the, the virus is so um, penetrant through all different organs, and we're trying to understand if it has a role in, um, in having a progressive component after patients recover from their COVID-19, or what about the asymptomatic individuals that are infected? Could that predispose them from developing fibrosis? And, and we don't just have those answers to those questions yet. Um, and so we're cautious to make any predictions, but certainly we want individuals to, to be appropriate and, and um, cautious, in, as we all should be in this time frame, to, to limit exposure, to limit um, uh, any of the risks that we have with the appropriate physical distancing and, and face covering. So it's, um, it's one of the most difficult questions because we don't have clear answers. And I think that's what's frustrating all of us. We need more data and we need better treatments for COVID-19, if not, and hopefully a vaccine and as soon as it's available and it's safe and it's effective. Um, but uh, just as my nephrology colleagues, cardiologists, we look at all across all specialties and the devastation of COVID-19 is, is quite apparent. Um, and before I think the anxiety further perpetuates with any of the, the consequences of it, we really need to track the data. And I'm encouraged to see that the National Institutes of Health has surveillance, whether it be the neurologic com complications or the pulmonary complications or, or the cardiovascular complications. Um, they're leading us to better understand the disease and in the short term, we need to do our best to reduce our risks so that um, when the data is out, then we can guide patients better to avoid any risks and tell them, you know, what, what truly could happen if you get the disease. If you have um, diabetes, we know it's a risk factor. If obesity is a risk factor and hypertension is, um, and what's the implications for other groups like those with lung fibrosis or asthma. So um, that's a long-winded answer to say we just don't have enough data yet to to clarify our future, but it's coming.